no matter where you live in the world, no, no matter what era you, lived, you live in, one of the things that's a constant is there's going to be natural disasters. There's going to be physical disasters. I mean, it's part of living in this world. Some disasters, like floods and tornadoes and fires, you might have some warning to get out of the way. You might. But COVID-19 was completely different. There, there was nowhere to run, and there's nowhere to hide. It, it was impossible to get out of the way. It's microscopic, as you know. It doesn't respect borders or politics or, eco or economies. It, it just simply took over. <laughs> and uh, it killed people, a lot of people. About two and a half million in the world, we, we think, maybe more. The United States was arguably the, one of the most hard-hit countries, even though we have the best health infrastructure in the world. Uh, we had, percentage-wise, more deaths than any other nation. Three times as many as infections, two times as many deaths. And we took extreme measures, maybe more than any other nation. We had lockdowns, quarantines, masking. We, we shut down everything. A lot of things went away for a long time. Whole industries will never return. Many of you will never go back to your favorite restaurant again because it can't come back. At the same time, the political, the, the racial tensions in this country were exacerbated throughout the entire summer and we were on edge with each other and America has been stretched to the limit. Some people would say this was the perfect storm to change our nation. It affected the church. It affected Christianity, and it still has. There's been a lot of discussion and anxiety and excitement about what will the church be now post-COVID as we're coming out of this pandemic. Every week I get invitations to conferences and online discussions from other church leaders about what the church is now supposed to be in light of this new reality. And I will admit, it's been a challenge for me not to look back at Third City prior to COVID-19. In the year 2019, before we went into lockdown, before we, you know, the days that we had full venues and, and, and kids programming that was busting at the seams so that we, we didn't have enough coaches for those kids and, and all the challenges. And, you know, we were going to Kenya and, and planning a church and starting a school and we had people going there. And it, it, it's easy for me to say, to say, oh, those were the days. Those were the good old days. You know what the good old days are, right? Those are the days for which we have forgotten about the bad old days. That's the good old days. I just want you to know that. We're, there really are no good old days. There's only our selective memory of those days. But that's how people see life, and that's how we read the book, book of Acts and the book that we're going to look at this morning. We, we kind of go there and we say, that's the way it's supposed to be. We look at this first century church, and we say, well, Luke, he just showed us this is what we're supposed to be. Now, there are things that we need to be, that we're going to learn about today. But I think it's easy to think that if we continue to thrive as a church, if we're going to be impactful, all we got to do is go back to some form of the good old days. Like, I, I, was, I received Jesus when I was 12, 13 years old, and, and I have great memories of that moment. And it's easy for me to be selective about that and say that was the best time of the church. And then I start to think about those times. And they weren't so great times for me in, in most other ways. But the one thing that was great was Jesus got my attention. That was great. And I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you today, Jesus wants to get your attention. And he wants to get the attention of this community and this city and this world. And there's never been a better time than now for that to happen. Because we're on task with Jesus. Acts chapter 2 is not a formula for success. Neither is whatever version of the church you remember the fondest from your selective memory. This is a picture of the church as it should be in whatever period of time we live in. 
And here's the primary message that comes out of this passage we're about to read together. We're better together. We're better together. And and if going through COVID has taught us anything, it's taught us this. We are not meant to do life in quarantine. We need community. We need each other. And we know that God's worshiping, serving, growing body of Christ on earth is going to only happen best when we're doing it as one in unity. I like how Dan described worship as living out our lives in response to a God who has loved us and wants to grow us. Josh said, it's hard for me to separate my worship from serving. It's impossible, he said, and he's right because they go hand in hand. We serve as a physical response in community with others for the purpose of the kingdom of God. And I am compelled to love others with my worship, with my serving. And that means that I have to be growing as a person and we need to be growing together as the church because we're better together. Now, Acts chapter 2, which we've been alluding to the last three weeks, is this encouragement to continue the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit that he began after the resurrection of, of Jesus Christ. So if we're going to be the change agent to take this world where it needs to go today, let us revisit what they did then because the, the, the essence are there. So the question is, what is the Lord doing here and now? How do we evaluate our reaction coming out of COVID-19 and all the chaos that that brought? And why should we be excited and hopeful for what God is going to do in the, in the near future? I would like you to indulge me by standing with me. And we're going to read together Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 41. So let's do that together. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to breaking the bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give them to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Thank you. You may be seated. What is the Lord doing there? And what does the Lord want to do here to grow us like he grew them? What what does he want to do? I think the key in that whole passage, the word that we need to at least start with, is that word, they were devoted, devoted Don't think about devoted as like devotions, like reading your Bible, quiet time, you know, the prayer time you might have in private, although I'm highly in favor of that. I hope you're doing it. That's not what he's talking about here. Devoted is to identify with, to be closely associated with, to attach oneself to Jesus and his cause. That's devotion. Devotion. One way to understand devotion is to understand what it means to be a diehard fan. Many of you are diehard Husker fans. You knew I was going to talk about it. If you were my age for about, oh, 50 years of your life, that brought you a lot of euphoric joy and success. Because we'd go into those games, and you know this, I mean, and, you know, until about 10, 15 years ago, and we'd think, oh, that poor opponent, they're just going to get steamrolled. <laughs> and we loved it. <laughs> Tons of great victories. And then for the last 10 or 15 years, they've tested my devotion. I mean, diehard fans aren't fair weather fans. The most discouraging conversation I ever have is with a, is with a fair weather fan. And now I'm talking about the church. 
about the person who kind of got what they wanted out of the church and then something maybe happened and that disappointed them or it didn't live up to their expectations and all of a sudden they're like, I think I better go look for another church. Look, that is, di- that is not diehead. That, that, that is fair weather. So here's the thing. A, a person who celebrates being in the lead We don't stop cheering when the lead evaporates. And I feel like the last year, the lead's kind of evaporated in the church. It's been a tough go. I have grandchildren. I am a diehard peepaw. That means that no matter what, I'm going to be on the march with those boys. I'm not a fair weather peepaw. I'm ridiculously, kind of stupidly hopeful about those little guys. But no matter what, I'm in it with, for the long haul. That's what devotion is. They devoted themselves. That's what it says. In other words, they were on march together with Jesus at the head of the platoon, and they did it together. And they didn't quit on each other. And by the way, they didn't call Caesar Lord, did they? And that put them at odds with their culture. It was Jesus. And we are better together because we are growing in our devotion to Jesus. And we know Jesus. And as we get to know Jesus, we become more like Jesus. We grow, we adapt, and we incorporate the apostles' teaching into the fabric of our lives. What does it mean to be devoted to the apostles' teaching? Does that mean that we simply study more, we add a new educational component to our lives? Well, not alone. I mean, that's part of it. Jesus changed everything for them. And the moment they came out of that baptism experience, they were a new person, just like you were when you came out of yours. They fully attached themselves to the purpose and mission of the kingdom of God on earth as led by Jesus. They were devoted to understanding and learning from the apostles who watched him do it all for three and a half years what that meant. And so he told, they told the stories about Jesus, all the things he did all the things he taught. And now we have the New Testament, which shows us that pattern. And we can grow by knowing him from what we know about him in the New Testament. And we do that together, because the word is, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship. Now, the word fellowship can be misleading. Like fellowship sounds like a big barbecue or something. We're going to show up and have food, which, by the way, I'm always in favor of. I love that. We're going to do something Wednesday night, big fellowship. It's going to be great. But our gatherings are not just for something like food or something like friendship, even though those are things that come with those. Our fellowship is for the purpose of being the kingdom of God on earth. So we should always be thinking about when we have something like Wednesday night, who can I bring with me so they can understand and get at least a glimpse of the goodness that I'm finding in my church? Fellowship. I think it's what many people have longed for over the last 14 months. We have learned over the last year that online worship is an incredible resource for making a first impression. It provides an option where there is none. Thank goodness we were ready to jump on that. But, but I, and you, you, you have to know this by now, even if you're still not back in person. It can't replace what true fellowship is, which is a gathering of people on purpose for Jesus. The body of Jesus ministers through a vast array of gifting that's personally and physically connected, and it greatly exceeds the chat rooms and the message boards that we become familiar with. Friends, you will never grow fully in Jesus Christ without the peer connection physically of other Christian people. It just won't happen. I can prove it to you. I can prove it to you. This last year, we were able to celebrate, as a church family, 80 baptisms. Now, that's a great thing, isn't it? Beautiful. Every one of those people somehow maneuvered their way through this mess called COVID-19 and found Christ in that way. The year before, there were 200. That in itself shows us Look, I'm grateful for the technology that's got us through 2019, but it's, or 2020, but it simply can't match the fellowship when we meet together. And by the way, fellowship doesn't mean you're going to be chummy with everyone. 
Like, like you, you, you know this as well as I do. You can walk into a church like this one, and you can say, they're here? Mm, I'll never be their friend. I want to be in their small group. You don't have to be. But you know what? In unity with Jesus, we're on the same team. We have the same marching orders. Prayerfully, we're heading the same direction. And Jesus is at the front of the line. He's at the front of the platoon. And you can work side by side with anybody if you have Jesus in your heart. And you may not be best friends, but we have Jesus. And he's our best friend. It's a good time for us to talk about what it means to be together. Because I believe we're going to be more and more together again. That's my prayer. The goal is growing the kingdom of God. One of the things that we're learning in the midst of 2020 and 2021 and all the adversity is that the Holy Spirit has been working, he is moving, and there will be incredible things that come out of this. I mean, at some extent, this broke down our resistance to being real with each other and and our self-sufficient attitude that makes us think we don't need other people. I hope you have learned And if you've not, I don't know what's wrong with you. You need people. You need people who know Jesus, who are on task with you and the calling that we have. So it's a good time for us to spend time together and to come back together to grow the kingdom of God. One of the results of their shared mission and their closer fellowship as they devoted themselves to, you know, the teaching of Christ, which is a whole life thing, to the fellowship, which is doing it together as a people in person, and to the breaking of bread and prayer. That's what it says. Now, in ancient Judaism, the custom was if you sat down for a formal meal, the first thing you did before you did anything else was there was this almost ceremonious breaking of the bread. And it symbolized something very important. It symbolized that that we are experiencing the joy and glory of being taken care of by God who gives us our daily bread. And, And so that's what we do as we come together. The Christians then, they ate together. But since Luke is writing this account decades after these events occurred, he has in view what we do specifically when we come together for the Lord's Supper, for the communion service that that we experience every week here. And so he's showing them that, look, you, in that moment of breaking bread, there's thanksgiving, there's rejoicing, there's the unity of the body doing this together, just like he showed his disciples the night before he was crucified when he broke bread with them, to remind them of something very important, that his mission is going to be fulfilled and that we will be fulfilling his mission until he returns. And we're in the same we're all in the, same, in the same body doing this. We are worshiping together. We are serving together. And we are growing together. The reality is all authority in heaven on earth has been given to Jesus. He's re- ruling the universe. He is here with his body, the church, when we commune together. And, and, and without this communion, it is very likely that you will drift away from God. And and those of you who are joining us online who still haven't come back, when you're able to do this, we're looking forward to that. But look, if you don't get back, you will drift. It's just natural because you need the majesty and power of the Holy Spirit as he works in the fellowship, in the moments of the church. They broke bread together, they prayed, they communed, they communicated with the Lord. And it says because they were doing that, their neighbors were at awe of them. They were in wonder of what they were seeing. And by the way, the apostles in that very first experience were doing some miraculous things. So that didn't hurt, did it? Have you ever thought, yeah, people were awed because they had these apostles doing these Tremendous miracles. If we have that going on, yeah, people would want to be here too. There's quite a bit of archaeological evidence about the religious practices of that time in history, in the first and second centuries. Most of the great temples had various gods who supposedly did miracles. And they used sophisticated machinery and chemistry 
to wow the crowds to, so that people would believe the gods had some kind of special power. What's fascinating is that the fairly sophisticated mechanical engineering was employed to have statues groan or speak or to cry tears of blood. There was this temple to Zeus that had an iron chariot that seemingly floated through the air in front of the statue of the god. And the competition was fierce for followers. And here's why. Because there was a humble Jewish rabbi who showed up in the world and started doing real miracles. Not the fakey ones that can be produced by Hollywood or, you know, by some, you know, extensive mechanical engineering at a Las Vegas showroom. Oh, no. The real kind of miracles. The healing of diseases. Feeding thousands of people out of thin air. Controlling the weather. weather raising the dead, including himself. And he gave those apostles some of those gifts when he needed to, to make sure that his church got started. The miracles of the apostles were not magic shows. They didn't just they didn't happen to wow people. They were not attempting to compete with the ancient temple show competition, nor were they the ancient equivalent of modern televangelists doing healings with movie tricks. These miracles were real, and they bore witness to the truth that God is alive. And Christ is still at work. And there are still signs and wonders that Jesus does. And I'm confident that somewhere in the world, probably today, there will be miracles that occur. They aren't as frequent, at least in the experience that we see in the New Testament. I will argue that many of us, maybe most of us, who are seeing this sermon, appearing here today in worship, will never see what would be called a bona fide biblical miracle. Not in our lifetime. But there are miracles. Oh, there are miracles. There are hardened hearts of people who are now in the center of Christ's plan for their life because they yielded control of the Holy Spirit and their lives are changing. And many of you are bearing witness to that in your own life. Some of you are here and you thought at one point your marriage was toast and your last hope was God. And you obeyed and you submitted and now you're still married and you have hope. And there are people whose addictions were ruining their lives, completely destroying them until you said, God, not me anymore, but you, and you're having healing. Reconciliation. The more the church is a place of healing and restoration, the more people will be in awe of what's going on in the body of Christ. And the same effect that will occur that happened in that early gathering in Jerusalem, the church will enjoy the favor of all the people. Enjoy the favor of all the people. I have uh, for some time now been concerned about the tone by which the church is being referred to in our world. I think that maybe one of the things that's happened is that the church has lost its focus and we've forgotten why we're here. And we've become somewhat self-centered. And it's begun with people self-centered. And that's translated into the fabric of the body of Christ. And so the people out there are looking in here and they're saying, well, they're just kind of a bunch of selfish people. Keeping themselves to themselves. Doing their thing for themselves. Keeping other people away because they are kind of stuck in this way, this mindset their personal resources for themselves. Look, Jesus Christ was not an add-on to their daily lives in the first century. He was at the center of the fabric of their lives and their body. And they had a new identity because of him. And it changed the world. There was a change in the name People joined the new family. They fellowshiped in the presence of Jesus their Lord. They communed together in open, in the open forum of the temple. And today, despite the world's constant efforts to drive the faithful into darkness and hiding and silence, ours is a life-encompassing, transforming call to be something different in this world. 
And there's never been a moment in history, maybe since then, where we can be more different and more needed. Because what they needed then, we need today. We need Jesus. And we're here for that purpose. Lord, we're going to break bread. We're going to do it for a purpose. This isn't a mid-morning snack during the service. This isn't something for kids to, to take a hold of because it looks cool. This is for people who are on task with you to say, here I am, Lord. I'm breaking bread with this group of people for this purpose, to be the kingdom of God on earth, to fulfill your will and your mission. And Lord, it's not easy, but it's good because you're good. And you're here. Your Holy Spirit's alive. And we have an opportunity, Lord, to be your body on earth in worship, service, and growth. And we celebrate Jesus in this moment. A Jesus who loved us enough to come and make that so. I just want to speak to those of you who have not yet returned to church, to, to, the, you know, to the physical fellowship of the church. And I'm not saying this is your time. I have no idea where you are in life. I have no idea what your circumstances are. I'm just going to say this to you. And please hear me from the heart now. You know, I, I think one of the things that can keep people from coming back is fear. Fear is a powerful thing. It's moved all of us. Who are those of who are here? We know. Fear has moved us the last year. And sometimes that, that we get this idea that if there's danger, we can't be a part of something. I'm going to tell you something about the church. Church is a dangerous thing. Church is dangerous. What I mean by that is, and many of you know this, to leave a life of sin, because, you know, there's comfort in sin. We find help and healing sometimes in sin for a while. It's a dangerous thing to leave that behind. It's a dangerous thing to change my allegiances from money and the love of a person, uh, of self-actualization, and thrust that into the hands of a Jesus I can't see. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous thing to align with a group of people who may be mistreated by those who don't understand them. But it's good. It's good because it's where the truth is and it's where the fellowship is and it's where we come to, on mission and kingdom service with the breaking of bread and prayer and it's where God makes a difference in the culture. It's the change agent to save the world, the church, the body of Christ. And we get to be a part of it. It's a beautiful thing when we understand that and we don't let fear drive us. You remember that movie, Field of Dreams? Ray Kinsella is given this confusion vision to build a, build a baseball field in the middle of nowhere, Iowa. And uh, he, he follows the vision, and it, tr it attracts ghosts from the cornfield. It's crazy, crazy deal. Now, by the way, I think this is a really good picture of the church, where, where God gives us a vision to build something, and it's beautiful. And then the ghosts start coming out of the field. That's us. And we find hope and joy and purpose and life in that field. Well, anyway, he kind of gets in trouble. He's ready to chuck the whole idea, Ray Kinsella. He's got lots of challenges. He's, you know, he's in debt and can't sustain it, he doesn't think. But he's still following the vision. Then the actor with one of the greatest voices of all time, James Earl Jones, makes this now often quoted statement. Because he wanted to chuck the idea. And he said, no, people will come, Ray. They will definitely come. 
This is God's field of dreams. He has a place for every one of us. We are ghosts in the field looking for life. And if we do this the way he calls us to do it, on purpose with him to build the kingdom of God, this is his field of dreams. Come dream with us.